Hey Grace Point, it's Kim Savage here and uh, I'm coming to you from on the water, uh, my very favorite place to be. Happy Sunday. I hope everybody is settled in to enjoy the morning service and whether you are live uh, at the watch party and get to do it or whether you are at home uh, with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, not everybody's a coffee person like me, I hope you just soak in the stories uh, that are going to be part of this service. So have a great morning and uh, I'll be watching online from our cabin. Take care. Bye. Hi, Grace Point. I'm Kate. This is Derek, my husband. Uh, we're really excited to worship with you today. Good morning, Grace Point, Rebecca here. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, some of you today at the worship party. Um, and we just wanna say a huge thank you from everyone at the staff. Since the beginning, you guys have been social distancing here like rock stars. So thank you so much and can't wait to worship with you guys. Welcome Grace Point Church. Glad to have you guys joining us for the service today. And as you see, I'm in the basement of the Grace Point Church building, and behind me is the mess as a result of the flood of 2020. And yes, it's been uh, a disaster, and of course the stuff is all here. And I think in some ways, church, it kind of reflects a metaphor for us that God wants to do a renewal, not just in our building as we rebuild, but in our hearts, in our souls, in our lives. And so I invite you this uh, fall to join with us in the story series that we'll be going through this journal. And hopefully you've gotten your copy from your discipleship group leader, or you've uh, swung by the church to pick it up. If you haven't, you can do so tomorrow, Monday, September 14th. That's when the journal begins between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Come by, get your copy of the journal. And then together, we're gonna go through our own stories and look at the renewal that God is doing in our lives. I'm standing here now in a place where, well, there used to be a wall right here, and Louisa had a desk here, kind of in the hallway, and Chris's office over here, and now we've made some modifications here, torn out some walls, put in some new walls to better accommodate ministry. Now Louisa has a full office, and we've got a great room here for youth leaders to gather and to pray and to plan. Again, that's a bit of a metaphor of what's happening and what can happen this fall in your life and my life as we go through the, uh, the story series together. God is always doing something new. So join us this fall in that. Don't just do the story journal alone. I encourage you to do it with others sign up for a discipleship group and the best way to do that is use the uh, the app grace point church app 
and sign up there. You'll see under program a form there. You fill it out and we will be in touch with you. Also, consider coming to one of the in-person services. I'm here on Tuesday evenings, Sunday mornings. I would love to see you here as well. Well, I think it's time for the service to start, so let's head upstairs. Well, welcome, church family. It is good to gather in the presence of the Lord and worship Him. I thought we'd start with uh, just a bit of Psalm 46, where it says, God is our refuge and our strength. He is a helper who is always found in times of trouble, and therefore we will not be afraid. Though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the seas, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with turmoil, there is a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is within her. She will not be toppled. God will help her when the morning dawns. Though nations rage and kingdoms will topple, the earth melts when he lifts his voice. The Lord of angel armies is with us. Our God, the God of Jacob, is our stronghold. Well, let's stand together and let's worship this God who is our stronghold, who is a never failing strength in all of life.
You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. I know nothing has been wasted. No failures or mistakes. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. And you make all things work together for my future. have a seat. I'd like to invite Steve up. Thank you, Greg and team, uh, for reminding us that God is indeed an artist and a creator and a writer. And one of the gifts that God has given us in, as he made us is the gift of imagination. And God, as you know, if you're familiar with the Bible, is a storyteller. Jesus told many stories, among them the prodigal son and the good Samaritan. And he used people's imagination. So would you please use your imagination with me now as I tell you a story to remind you that God is still writing amazing stories today. Do you see her there? She... She's been forced out, forced out of her family home. And now the door, it shuts behind her for the very last time. See her coming down the stairs with that suitcase, with all of her earthly belongings. She walks down the residential street in Abbotsford, walking quickly so nobody will know that she has no place to go. No fixed address. She walks, not knowing where she's going to go. Tears running down her eyes. Suddenly, a car honks at her. She fearfully turns around and looks. And as the window comes down, it's a friend. It's a friend from high school who she just recently graduated with. And the friend says to her, where are you going? What are you up to? Oh, I'm, I'm going nowhere. I mean, I mean well, I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Well, w where are you going? <sighs> well, I'm going somewhere. Well, why don't you just come over for some coffee? Let's do some coffee and chat. Sure. Hey, after a while, why don't you stay the night here? Oh, okay, if you really want me to. And so she stays the night there. And then another night, and then it becomes a week and another week. Eventually, she winds up joining, somewhat feeling obligated, a Bible study that is happening in this home for ladies. She joins it, and eventually, 
she goes to church with this family. And while at church, she hears the good news about Jesus, and her life is changed. The young woman grows in her faith, obeys God's call, and she begins to follow him wherever he leads her. She grows in her love relationship with God. This young woman eventually marries and has children. And she begins to prepare a room in her home, even though it's a small home, it's a town home, for anybody who does not have a place to stay. As well, she also begins leading Bible studies. All the while, she works full time and raises a young family. And to this day, she always looks for ways to show the hospitality that God showed her. And God is still writing her story. And though she has faced many challenging times, she continues to pursue the God that invited her into his story. I know this woman well. She's my wife. Friends, God is still writing amazing stories. There's an ancient Jewish thought that says the reason God created humankind is because God loves stories. God loves stories. As you know, our Lord told so many stories to draw people into a larger and eternal story. The story of God And the opening words of Genesis say, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. That makes all other stories possible. But we too have been called into a story. God is writing a grand story, eternal story. I'm wondering if you would trust God to help write your story for the days ahead as Harjit did. If you do, my friends, you'll be on a divine adventure with eternal impact. And the easy answer is yes, of course. Who wouldn't sign up for that? But it involves trust. And that's not easy. For after all, there are many competing storylines in our world that demand our attention. Even for those of us who desire to follow God, we can be easily distracted by another story rather than the story of God. And that's where our text today takes us. Follow along with me through the sermon notes on the Grace Point app or turn in your uh, Bibles to Exodus 33. As we move through this text, it'll be like climbing a mountain. We'll be headed to the peak after we conquer a few small peaks. Verse, chapter 33, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Get going, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your descendants and I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. But, but, I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. Well, that kind of sounds harsh. I like the idea about the promised land with milk and honey. That sounds harsh. I would destroy you. But really, only on the surface, my friends. A little bit of context. After our first parents were seduced away from God's story into the story of Satan in the garden, God started writing a new story for humanity by enlisting a man named Abram. 
And he enlisted this man, and as the story goes, his descendants, eventually, who we read about in this earlier text, wound up as slaves in Egypt. But God, because of his great love, rescued them. He kept his promise to Abraham. And he used a person by the name of Moses to do the rescuing. Moses, who got constricted into God's story, led the people out of Egypt on the journey towards the promised land. And one day, as Moses was up on a mountain with God, waiting for some new instructions, the people, they got tired of waiting. They got impatient. And this really revealed where their belief really was, where their trust was at. They turned their backs on God, and they fashioned various idols, including a golden calf. And they began to worship it. And they called upon it for guidance and for fortune. They opted out of God's story for them into another story. The truth is that we as human beings are always looking to fashion our lives around some ideal. Who are you looking to? Who are you trying to impress? Where are you getting your guidance from? What is giving you meaning these days? Maybe, like the people in our story, you're wondering where God is. Perhaps his apparent silence or absence has led you to drift away and seek some other storyline for your life. Our culture offers a competing story. The focus of that story is you. You get to decide your values, your identity and purpose, and the meaning of success. Everyone is unique. And this story replaces the worship of God with self. The story is about us, our looks, our image in the community, what people think about us, having what they value. Everything belongs to us, our time, our money, our wishes. We take charge. But through disappointment, some of us have learned the seduction of our choice and the promise of freedom only led to enslaving us to keeping up a certain image. And the false gods only have the power of marketing, but no substance. They fail us. They do not deliver as promised. And in our story, to date, God had been very good to the people. He provided for their needs in the desert journey. He had directed them. His presence was with them during the day and with the night. He protected them from their enemies. But they were seduced by their lack of genuine trust in God. They were stubborn and rebellious, as we read. Now, the term stubborn and rebellious is fitting. Think about it. Imagine you have a dog, and you want the dog to come this way, but the dog on the leash refuses and wants to go the other way. It will not obey you. That's what it means to be stubborn and rebellious. And so as we read in this verse, I will not travel with you because you are stubborn and rebellious. If I did, I would surely destroy you. Now this verse reminds us of God's view of sin. Sin is destructive to the individual. It spoils our lives. It is a pandemic that goes from one person to another. And its effects can be passed on to subsequent generations, like the disease of alcohol. Alcohol, left unchecked, visits the emotional, financial, and moral consequences for generations of people trapped in it. But we need to be clear about something, and which our story will later make clear also. Let us understand that when 
God withdraws his presence from Israel, it was not a severing of the relationship. God would only stand at a distance and let the people's choices bear fruit until they had enough of their empty worship or they repented. God is always there. Now, there's good news in this story. The people return to the ultimate and eternal story of God. You see, God told Moses, this is what I'm up to. Moses let the people know that God was going to leave them, but he was going to keep his promise. They would get to have what they wanted, but they wouldn't get him. God would not be traveling with them. And this bothered the people. They wanted the giver, not just the gifts. They wanted the blesser, not just the blessing. And so we read in our text in verse 4 that the people mourned. And this was evidenced by their obeying God. For they took off the jewelry and the fine clothes. By the way, the jewelry came from the Egyptians as they were leaving. It wasn't even theirs. It was a gift granted by God. And yet, they used that jewelry to fashion idols. But verse 5 gives us a glimpse into God and discipline. And notice in verse 5 that God has not yet disciplined them. In fact, the text states that God says, take off the jewelry and fine clothing while I decide what to do. We all must agree that sin must be punished because of the way it spoils our lives. God disciplines us to bring us back to himself. And we see that God waits to see if the people will share his heart regarding sin. He waits. God is slow to anger and discipline. I know that in my own life. How many times have I been stubborn and rebellious? And God has not hit me with a lightning bolt. God has been slow to punish me. Yes, at times he's disciplined me, but for my own good. But he's always been gentle and merciful. And praise God that he is compassionate and merciful. He desires good story outcomes for us. He waits for us to return to his leadership. Now in verse 8 to 10, it's very interesting in our text because it says, whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, which is just a tent he set up, all the people would get up and stand in the entrance of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside his tent. And as he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. And when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Now, a little bit of geography here. God used to meet with the people in the tent of tabernacle right in the middle of the camp. It was a sign that I, for your own good, need to be in the center of your lives. But God withdrew his presence. And the only reason he was willing to meet with Moses and Joshua was because they're the only ones who didn't bow to the image. Even Moses' brother Aaron got sucked into fashioning the idols. So the camp, the tent of meeting that Moses had, was at some distance, outside the camp. But yet we read when the people saw the cloud representing the presence of God, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. What good news. They've repented now, putting aside the jewelry and fine clothing. They've repented now. They've changed their allegiance to come back to worship God. And this is such good news for Moses because this is what he's been praying about for the people. And in verses 
12 to 17, and we'll just move through it quickly, we see Moses, in a sense, almost demanding, arguing, pleading with God and saying, God, are you really going to go with us as we travel? You said you wouldn't. Are you going? And he pleads with God. And it's often said that while God may love stories, Jewish prophets love questions. And so Moses asks God a series of questions, just like Job did, just like David did, just like Jeremiah and numerous other prophets. The prophets wrestled with God, and Moses wrestles, and he pleads with, the, with God, and he says, you've really got to come with us, not only for our protection, but we need your presence, because God, God, we just don't want to be a people. We want to be a people in whom you rest on. So when the nations look at us, they'll go, hey, there's something different about these people. It's almost like Moses is saying, we want the aroma of Christ. We want to be distinct. And the apostle Peter picks up on this in his epistle when he talks about us being the people of God and and a unique people and a people called for God's purposes. This is what Moses is talking about. This is what he wants for the people. Not only protection, but the presence of God. And he wants it to be evident in the community. No more turning against God. And God says to him, All right, in verse 17, I will indeed do what you ask, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses, I know you personally. I know you. And when it says by name, it means like really intimately. I know you by name. But guess what? Moses isn't finished. God is so favorable towards Moses. Moses says, okay. And this, by the way, friends, is hitting the peak. This is the crescendo of the Christian experience. Moses says, if you really are for me and you know me, I'd like you to do something. I'd like you to show me yourself in all your glory. That's what I want. That's what I want. I mean, you know me, but I want to know you deeper. Now think about this. When Moses first encounters God uh, uh, on the same mountain that he got the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 3.13, Moses says to God, hey, if I go to rescue the people and they say, who sent you? What should I say? Like, what's your name? And God says, I am that I am. Remember that experience? And now Moses once again has seen the goodness of God through his life. And he's seen God do amazing things. He's seen God send him to Egypt and rescue the Hebrew slaves. And he saw God crush the Egyptian system. It crumbled. And he also saw how God was gentle with the rebellious Israelites over and over again. He knows God as a friend. He knows God to be awesome. But Moses also knows something else. You see, Moses was adopted as a child of the queen of Egypt. And Moses had tasted the wealth of the land. He knew that story, my friends. He'd seen the great architecture. And yet, Moses came to this conclusion. Only God alone satisfies. He's tasted of the world, and he's had glimpses into God, but he says, I want more. In Psalm 63, King David declared, your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. You satisfy me more than a richest feast. 
He's writing that at a time when he's hungry in the desert, being chased by his enemies. Oh, he longs for God. He's tasted of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's the real thing. That's what really quenches the thirst of our souls. No wonder, my friends, Jesus said, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul. My friends, it's only God that satisfies. So no wonder Moses is so bold in verse 18. Show me your glorious presence. I want more. I want more. Remember, Moses has heard God speak to him, but that's not enough. Moses has seen God act powerfully in Egypt. That's not enough. Moses has seen the cloud and felt the presence. That's not enough. He wants more. He wants to get as close as he can. Moses is hungry for God. My friends, are you hungry for God? Moses wants to get so close to God. And the Lord replied in verse 19, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one can see my face and live. Now, just want to help you understand that. We know people have seen God's face, right? Uh, and lived, but what we're talking about here, and there's numerous examples in scripture, but what we're talking about here is God saying, see my face as it really is. You and I can look at the sun 93 million miles away, but if we were to get too close, our eyes would burn out. So we really can't look at it in a sense, face to face. And God's overwhelming glory would blow us apart So God turns it down and says, you can look at my back as I pass by, and then you'll see see me. Friends, Moses' name lives on in history. His story has been told and known for over 4,000 years, and he's a major figure in Judaism, in Christianity, and in Islam. Billions of people know the story of the parting of the Red Sea. But fame with people was not Moses' goal. It was intimacy with God. Friends, how hungry are you for God? When we pursue intimacy with God, our soul and story find their ultimate rest, their ultimate fulfillment. Revelation 22 states where the story of God with humanity is headed. One day there'll be a huge party. Producer and cast invited. Listen to this from Revelation 22, verse 3. No longer will there be a curse on anything. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. Oh man, I can't wait. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. Do you get that intimacy? Name, face, reigning together. What an amazing story to look forward to, knowing the God of the story, being with him. Friends, are you interested in just the gifts or the giver? we can begin to know God intimately if we pursue him. Perhaps due to struggles in your life and impatience with God, you've quit the story with God. You chose what you thought was best. You've borrowed ideas from other cultural stories. Friend, they will never satisfy you. You need to return back to God. For our true life is about dwelling in the living God. He is our life. And you know, some of us have been raised in Christian homes or been in the church for many years. We have not understood the essence of the Christian message. And that is what is so different about being a Christian. It's not attending church 
or following a set of beliefs. Those elements point us to something greater, to a greater purpose. But they themselves are not the purpose. My teaching here today to invite you here and to be here together is not about seeing the lights or what I have to say, hopefully. I hope it's to point you to the God of life. There will be no true joy regardless of the amount of biblical knowledge you have or how long you've attended without a pursuit and intimacy from God. You will have missed the point. You, you may even do your best to live a moral life, but you're not living in the story of God. I encourage you, friends, to enter the story of God. I encourage you to understand your own story and what God has already been doing by registering for a group, if you haven't already, to learn more about how God will co-write a greater story with your life. Don't get in the way. Join God in co-writing that story. God is writing a grand, victorious, eternal story of which you can be a part. Would you trust God to help you in living the best story you can? One that goes beyond a common one of just paying the bills, saving for RSPs, hoping you have enough, and then dying. Why not live a significant story as we learned that Harjit is living? A story that nourishes your soul and has an eternal impact. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you. And Lord, if there's areas in our lives you've shown us, we want to just repent right now. We want to repent, Lord, for following a different story, listening to another voice, using other markers to determine our success, even hiding behind religion to avoid you. Oh, Lord, we don't want to just be attenders. We want to know you. We want to be like Moses. We want to pursue you. So, Father, I just pray for us as a people, as Moses pleaded for his people, Father, we pray that your presence would be mighty among us, that people would say, now they have been with God. We pray that, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you would bring us back from all the false gods that will definitely fail us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Steve. Well, church, God is speaking through his word, through his servant, and uh, I'll bet there's, there's something in a scripture, something that Steve shared, something in a song that God has just spoken right into this place where he wants to meet you. So we have the opportunity to, to answer and to identify, Lord, I'm right here. I'm ready for you to do in me the work that you want to do. So let's stand, put a song on our lips, and speak to God as we do so.
Friends, there are, there are many stories and we can choose which story that is that will lead us to victory and that is the story of God. I want to encourage you just as a practical measure to consider uh, registering online for a discipleship group where you can read how God has been working in your story and how he's going to continue. That's a practical outwork of our sermon. So let me give you this blessing as you go. May God's favor rest on you mightily as you pursue the God who is relentless in his love for you. Amen.